The next three days, the 17th, 18th, and 19th of April, 1941, are a little blurred in my memory. The fourth day, the 20th of April, is not blurred at all. My logbook records that from Elevsis Aerodrome, on the 17th of April I went up three times, on the 18th of April I went up twice, on the 19th of April I went up three times, on the 20th of April I went up four times. It was the first of these sorties that I will never forget. It stands out like a sheet of flame in my memory. On that day, somebody behind a desk in Athens or Cairo had decided that for once, our entire force of hurricanes, all 12 of us, should go up together. The inhabitants of Athens, so it seemed, were getting jumpy, and it was assumed that the sight of us all flying overhead would boost their morale. Had I been an inhabitant of Athens at that time, with a German army of over 100,000 advancing swiftly on the city, not to mention a Luftwaffe of about 1,000 planes all within bombing distance, I would have been pretty jumpy myself and the sight of 12 lonely hurricanes flying overhead would have done little to boost my morale. Our formation was being led by Flight Lieutenant Pat Pattle. Now, Pat Pattle was a legend in the RAF. At least he was a legend around Egypt, the Western Desert, and in the mountains of Greece. He was far and away the greatest fighter ace the Middle East was ever to see, with an astronomical number of victories to his credit. It was even said that he had shot down more planes than any of the famous and glamorized Battle of Britain aces. And this was probably true. Round and round Athens we went. And I was so busy trying to prevent my starboard wingtip from scraping against the plane next to me, that this time I was in no mood to admire the grand view of the park, or any of the other famous relics below. On that morning of the 20th of April, Flight Lieutenant Packle, the ace of aces, who was leading our formation of 12 hurricanes over Athens, was evidently assuming that we could all fly as brilliantly as he could, and he led us one hell of a dance around the skies above the city. We were flying at about 9,000 feet, and we were doing our very best to show the people of Athens how powerful and noisy and brave we were, when suddenly the whole sky around us seemed to explode with German fighters. They came down on us from high above, not only 109s, but also the twin-engine 110s. Watchers on the ground say that there cannot have been fewer than 200 of them on the We broke formation, and now it was every man for himself. What has become known as the Battle of Athens began. I find it almost impossible to describe vividly what happened during the next half hour. You're in a small metal cockpit, where just about everything is made of riveted aluminium. There is a plexiglass hood over your head, and a sloping bulletproof windscreen in front of you. Your right hand is on the stick, and your right thumb is on the brass firing button on the top loop of the stick. Your left hand is on the throttle, and your two feet are on the rudder bar. You can turn your head, and you can move your arms and legs, and the rest of your body is strapped so tightly into the tiny cockpit that you cannot move. Between your face and the windscreen, the round orange-red circle of the reflector sight glows brightly. Wherever I looked, I saw an endless blur of enemy fighters whizzing towards me from every side. They came from above, and they came from behind, and they made frontal attacks from dead ahead. And I threw my hurricane around as best I could, and whenever a Hun came into my sights, I pressed the button. It was truly the most breathless, and in a way the most exhilarating time I have ever had in my life. They got five of our twelve hurricanes in that battle. One of our pilots bailed out and was saved. Four were killed. Among the dead was the great Pat Patton, all his lucky lives used up at last. And Flight Lieutenant Timber Woods, the second most experienced pilot in the squadron, was also a those killed. I caught glimpses of planes with black smoke pouring from their engines. I saw planes with pieces of metal flying off the fuselage. I saw the bright red flashes coming from the wings of the Messerschmitts as they fired their guns. And once I saw a man whose hurricane was in flames climb calmly out onto a wing and jump off. Greek observers on the ground, as well as our own people on the airstrip, saw the five hurricanes going down in smoke. But they also saw something else. They saw 22 Messerschmitt shot down during that battle, although none of us ever knew who got what. The sky was so full of aircraft that half my time was spent in actually avoiding collisions. 
I'm quite sure that the German planes must often have gotten each other's way, because there were so many. And that, together with the fact that there were so few of us, probably saved quite a number of our skin. I stayed with them until I had no ammunition left in my gun. I had done a lot of shooting, but whether I had shot anyone down or, or even hit him, I could not say. I did not dare to pause for even a fraction of a second to observe results. When I finally had to break away and dive for home, I knew my hurricane had been there. The controls were very soggy, and there was no response at all to the rudder. But you can turn a plane after a fashion with the ailerons alone, and that is how I managed to steer the plane back. Thank heavens the undercarriage came down when I engaged the lever, and I landed more or less safely at Alepsis. I taxied to a parking place, switched off the engine and slid back the hood. I sat there for at least one minute, taking deep, gasping breaths. I was quite literally overwhelmed by the feeling that I had been into the very bowels of the fiery furnace and had managed to claw my way out. Two airmen, a fitter and a rigger, came trotting up to my machine. I watched them as they walked slowly all the way around it. Then the rigger, a balding middle-aged man, looked up at me and said, Blimey, mate, this kite's got so many holes in it, it looks like it's made out of chicken wire. I undid my straps and eased myself upright in the cockpit. Do your best with it, I said. I'll be needing it again very soon. So we now had seven half-serviceable hurricanes left in Greece. And with these, we were expected to give air cover to the entire British Expeditionary Force, which was about to be evacuated along the coast. The whole thing was a ridiculous farce. 